Good morning. How is how how is how are everyone today? Uh, gosh, what a week we've had. The IPMA uh, webinar series this week has been so successful, and it's because of you guys. Honestly, thank you, thank you so much uh, for your faithfulness uh, of being with us every day. Again, I will apologize for the afternoon session yesterday. You know that. Uh, has been pro postponed to a later date. Uh, I know so many of you were looking forward uh, to Martin, uh, as I was, uh, but, you know, stuff happens. We all know that. Uh, if you've been on here before, I know John Johnson knows what he's supposed to do because he's got his question box open and he's already said hello to me this morning. So, and Fritz, Fritz, you have been so faithful. Thank you. Can you too? Um, it's just so good to to see these names that, uh, at, you know, last year conference, we had uh, a medical emergency in my family and I couldn't come and I missed it so much, but I do appreciate everybody's prayers and good wishes. And yes, my husband's doing great. Um, he's, uh, he's alive, you know, and actually uh, the, his heart, didn't kill him, but I almost did after uh, being quarantined with him for uh, two months. <laughs> but no, I'm teasing. I love him. Uh, good morning, Kurt. Uh, everybody, yep, everybody's coming on. Uh, just want to re remind everybody, yes, we had the IPMA 2021 20, conference location announcement. And I am really, really excited. They is my neighbors to the north. Love dearly. Uh, Des Moines, Iowa, state capital, beautiful, beautiful city, and uh, just such friendly, wonderful people, and got a education on Des Moines. I know probably most of us know, you know, they're the corn producers. Uh, anyone that's driven uh, north, south, east, or west across Iowa in the summer, and you got uh, especially at night driving through those cornfields. Uh, sometimes you feel like you just got to stop and scrape your windows off. But uh, I've got a little question for you to see uh, if you know a little trivia. Uh, right now, corn is like the number one product produced, uh, agriculture product produced in Iowa. But who can tell me if it always was or if there was something else there was another and and mike lloyd uh you can't you can't answer this question question because you know it so that's i'll give you the answer later if you can't uh remember hello kelly john john sir and talk to us you guys are also great so faithful thank you so much hi sherry uh Yep, there just keeps coming on. We've still got about a minute. I'm going to give everybody some time. Hi, Amy. Uh, and Kelly, you've been with us from the beginning. Love you. Uh, so, yeah, trivia question of the day is before corn, what was uh, I was bumper crop? Okay. Gosh, there's just so many. Get those question box open so that you'll have them at your fingertips when, um, if you if you got a question during today's presentation, you can uh, don't hesitate. You, you can go ahead and, and type it in. You don't have to wait till that time. Um, everything's uh, really good here. It's it was 59 degrees when I woke up uh, this morning and. It was 90 with the 70 percent humidity on uh, Tuesday, so life is good. All right, I think uh, we're going to go ahead and get started with our presentation for today. Let me make a little change here. And uh, today we are uh, doing designing for discounts. Uh, mail piece design to qualify for discounted USPS postage. And our presenter is Andy Wright. And he's...
he is the mail services supervisor for the University of Oklahoma. Andy, good morning. Hello. How are you today? Good, good. I just want to thank you so much, IPMA. So appreciative of the time uh, that you're taking out from I know is a busy, busy day to be with us to share your expertise in uh, your ma in mailing services. Well, let's hope Thanks everybody so knows that will be here. after the presentation. This will be my first one. So. Oh, you'll do great. You'll do great. <laughs> You won't hear me, but I'll be going. <laughs> go, Andy. Go, Andy. Go, Andy. Okay, so let's get this started. This started as a design. Sorry about that. Are we good to go? All right. So like I said, this started as our class for our departments, and it was strictly for whoever did the mailings in that department. And we had a lot of changeover and stuff. So when we became printing and mailing together, it kind of helped with getting the communication going through everybody. So we could eliminate a lot of the issues because we knew I'm going to handle it, John and Sherry are going to print it. So we trained all of our CSRs and eliminated a ton of problems we've had. So hopefully this is kind of, this will kind of give everybody some information. Um, like I said, design, print, mail. So start to finish. We know we would love to have it to be straight line, start to finish. They're not always that easy. Obviously, a lot of times it looks like this. There's a lot of more steps involved and a lot more people involved as far as designers and CSRs and what the customer wants and what I need in order to print and mail. So uh, occasionally, mailings look like this. So we've run into that a few times. This is what we're trying to eliminate through the whole process. So I try to tell everybody, and, and I've kind of picked this up for myself at, at several different conferences, I use this analogy a lot. So if anybody's ever played golf, when you start playing golf, everybody in the world wants to tell you how to play golf, how to swing a golf club. So simple Google search, how to swing a golf club, 134 million results. So just remember through this, I'm telling you our one way that we do it. So take pieces of it, take the whole thing, whatever you need, but make it work for you. So as we're going, so what's the goal through the whole thing? The goal is get the get the envisioned mail piece from the customer to the recipient in the most efficient way and the best condition. So that's through the mailing process, through my addressing process, whatever it may be. But the customer has it in their hand. They know what they want the piece to look like when the recipient gets it. So that's our job to do the best we can through the whole process. So from design uh, CSRs in customer has their expectations they know what it what they want it to look like in the customer's hand but it still has to work for everybody it has to work through the printing process has to work for USPS regulations getting it mailed getting it through the whole thing so our job is guide and educate the customer do the best we can to get that mail piece where they want it so education wise we want to keep it simple this is to the customer have to remember they may know nothing about printing and mailing at all they just want to get the piece to the person so a lot of people are visual people so that basically i keep a lot of samples personally i keep a lot of samples i like in hand kind of here's what it looks like type thing that way they can feel it see it and they understand a little better rather than just trying to draw them a picture and explain it. So I keep tons of samples, good ones, bad ones. They see the whole process. They uh, can tell what, what's been done wrong, uh, simple little things at, that we can do to fix it. A lot of times the fixes can be as simple as a uh, paperweight, uh, a quarter inch bigger mail piece. Um, the, what, the simply is the way it folds to go through the postal service. So. We go, this is the original presentation. This is what we did. Oh, we, we tried to do it quarterly, then it went to 
about every six months we would do it offer it through our hr department to the to the actual departments so uh, we're designing for discounts this was originally a thing a ton of people from a, the beginning were sending everything just first class they just wanted it out didn't realize they could do anything to save money so that was kind of our job to show them simple little things they could do to cut their postage cut all their costs so the actual agenda of the presentation uh, discount postage qualification so what it takes to qualify for the discounts what the postal service requires minimum sizes all that so uh, orientation address placement as simple as moving the address from the top of the piece to the bottom of the piece again i keep the design samples there's some pictures on some slides later that i'll show you on those uh, verification requirements and an indicia versus metered postage so we could actually run it and just run it through the mail machine and put postage on or if they want the piece a little cleaner you can print the nonprofit or the first class and dice on it so some of these we can just kind of flip through i don't have to give you guys the whole class but i'll just kind of flip through this is how we did it so simple requirements of a minimum of how many pieces it takes to qualify anything under that minimum obviously has to go first class but we'll still design and do the best we can for the customer uh, identical weight of the pieces so anytime there's uh, we've got a, a late one that they're, they're doing t-shirts so we try to explain we'll do some options but a small shirt and a double x shirt is not going to go at the nonprofit because they're so different so these are all the basic just simple qualification requirements for it idea of cheaper postage faster delivery because you're basically the reason you're getting the discount is you're doing a little bit of work for the postal service so that's how we get the discount we skip a couple of steps uh, non-automation versus automation which is a simple terminology for the postal service but is it going to run through the machine is somebody going to have to handle it by hand so again being visual people some of the customers weren't understanding so these are actual postal machines this is how fast they're running so 36,000 pieces an hour you're you're looking at 10 pieces a second so that's where paperweight comes in uh, envelope design comes in uh, that's why they eliminated staples and stuff years ago the machines just didn't cooperate so we we can work our way through all the possible issues and eliminate those before they actually happen same thing this is a flat sorting machine uh, let's go all right so this is this is simple these are all templates supplied by the postal service so aspect ratio is basically just the proportion of your mail piece put the corner at the bottom corner into that little l at the bottom top corner has to hit in that gray area if it doesn't then you have issues so we can change as simple as from a you know an a5 to an a7 just simple envelope changes so this is your aspect ratio as far as less than 1.2 or 1.3 is going to cause you issues anything over 2.5 is going to cause you an extra charge it can still mail but they're going to charge you so at nonprofit rates that's potentially doubling your cost of the mailing so we can walk them through the simple change this size and a lot of them for when we first started were just simply this is what we've always done and they had no idea so the changes were easy everybody seemed to be pretty accepting especially once they realized how much money it was going to save same kind of thing for flats this is minimum size for flat maximum size for flat maximum thickness for the flats so anything over the three quarter inch becomes a parcel so that steps you up into a whole different category uh, that can actually potentially triple or quadruple your postage tabbing requirements this changed several years ago with the postal service it used to be small tabs like a one inch tab now it's an inch and a half tab they go to depending on how the piece folds it could have potentially just one tab or two tabs on the top which is easy to some that have three and four tabs so a lot of customers don't like the tabs so we can tell them you can either change your fold and we can eliminate down to you know two tabs or we can put it in an envelope i mean that that's always an option if they don't like the tabs at all and they're just bound to determine they're not going to do that then we'll uh, let them know that it's obviously it's going to have to go first class this is a new one for the postal so well i say new several years new but this is new used to everything that folded was just a self mailer 
They changed several years ago to anything that is actually bound. So anything with staples or glued together is a booklet now, not just a self mailer. So they have their own set of tabbing restrictions or rules. Uh, regular letter size mail, this is strictly for address placement. This is where the area needs to be cleared, dedicated just to the address and the barcode. That will eliminate any issues with the mailing machines for the postal service as far as reading because at the speed they're running through, they want it good and clear, nothing to cause them any issues with the barcode. So flat size also changed the address placement on it. it used to be, it could go anywhere on it. Now it is strictly in the top half of the envelope or the top half of the flat, I'm sorry. Uh, it could potentially, it used to be on the bottom. That is gonna cause you the not automation rates. We've totally eliminated that here. Uh, we just had a couple of places that did magazines that uh, we were able to just tell them all you have to do is flip it over, address panels at the top instead of the bottom now and your problem solved. So pretty simple. These, now some of these are a little old, you'll have to forgive me. Some of these are a little old sample wise, but they're good examples of issues we had when we first started doing this class and all the stuff that we've eliminated to where we don't have any problems. This specific one, uh, obviously the issue is there's not enough room lengthwise for the barcode. The, the color is not necessarily the issue, but that red line is gonna cause an issue because that will read as another line in the barcode. So simply by eliminating that red line, we could do it. We've had customers say, well, let's just not do it automated and we just won't print a barcode on it. Well, if you don't, the postal service is going to. So as you can see on the bottom of this piece, they're gonna slap a big sticker on it and potentially cover up important information on your mail piece. Uh, same thing on this one. This is as simple as all you need to do. I mean, the size is not an issue. All they have to do is take that little black line out. Uh, again, the read zone for the letter size pieces, if you try to print an address above the information at the bottom of this, it's going to push you above the read zone, cause you a non-automation rate or potentially non-machinable, which would double your postage on that one. This goes back to the template of your orientation aspect ratio. This bottom bottom corner of this piece into that template, the top corner ends up being out of that gray area. So just because it's square, that way the, the machine doesn't know how to orient once it's square, it could run through on its side, then it's not gonna read the address. Now it's gonna direct it back to another person that physically has to do it by hand. So it's gonna delay it. That's, that's where the extra charge comes in. Simple as, again, not enough room for the barcode. You do have the ability to print the barcode at the bottom. You can tell on this one, we just barely squeezed it in there. So it doesn't look as great. So, so like I said, sometimes the problems are as simple as we'll just eliminate an eighth of an inch of the bottom of that color and we're back to good. So flat, this is an old one. This is how it used to come out. This is one, like I said, address was strictly at the bottom. Basically, all we did was pull that address panel to the top, push the pictures to the bottom, and no issues with the postal service. Again, with the machines, how fast the machines run, this label. We had several departments that used to do these. So this label basically, as fast as it runs through, they read right to left, so the most prominent and the heaviest address is the return address. So a lot of these would cycle through. We could send them back to the postal service, but then again, you're delaying them a day or two. If some, some of them only saw three or four times. So it, it's, it's just how fast, the best way you can get that through the system. Verification requirements, these are verification. This was again, this was the class to our departments. So. Central mail requirements, this is how we ask for information from the customers. Uh, when we initially started this, we had five or six, seven different formats that we would get mailing lists in. So as long as they were consistent, we kind of worked our way through. So we really wanted to get a standard format as far as 
like an Excel file, all the names in one column, addresses in another. A lot of them were jumbled around initially. So we asked them for samples in the mail piece. So obviously next year, if they said, I want to do the same thing, we could backtrack and see what they were talking about. Again, now that we're printing and mailing together, printing services keeps those as well. So uh, it makes it a little simpler on all of us. Straight on the USPS side, this is when verification became a new, uh, why we have to verify the list, what verifying the list does for the customer, how they get better delivery, they get more correct addresses. So if anyone's filed a change of address form, they have everything with them and uh, they will get the current address. Some departments, initially when we first started doing this, some departments didn't like the Indicia. They thought it looked like junk mail. The people aren't going to read this. It looks like junk mail. They're just going to throw it away. So we gave them the option of being able to still put physical postage on it. The top one is what their normal, regular first class mail piece going out looks like. The bottom one is a nonprofit, so it simply just adds the words nonprofit in there. So nobody, nobody will know the difference. The piece looks the same. So some people chose that. Some people still didn't like it. This is our reply envelopes. Years ago, uh, I didn't give a whole lot of information about myself when I started. I've been here, well, two weeks will be 24 years, so I've seen a lot of changes. For, for a long time, the rules were you could not qualify for a nonprofit discount without a business reply or a courtesy reply envelope. This envelope at the top is a business reply. That means basically the envelopes that come back, the department pays the postage for. The bottom is a courtesy reply where the customer has to put their stamp on it, but you've just supplied them an envelope. So we've kind of still stuck to that because like I said, I've seen a lot of changes through the postal service. They currently changed it to where it doesn't have to be a courtesy reply envelope in there to qualify for the discount. But I personally, I've just kind of stuck to that because there's no saying they're not going to change back. So that is basically the end of the presentation that we gave to the departments, the old one that we gave to the departments. So you kind of have an idea of how we started and, and what information we basically gave them. So to the new, once we're together, the, the, the new communication that we have between the customer, printing, mailing, all the way through with the postal service. So the initial communication became between mailing services and the CSRs at printing services to kind of train them. So we kind of gave them the uh, same class, the same presentation that I just showed you that we were giving to the departments. So uh, we ran through that, let them have any questions. Then they could also educate me a little bit because I, I've been mailing for years and years and years. Printing is still I'm still learning printing, so printing is still a little different to me. So they learned, I learned that the, it's it's been really, really good for both of us. So the whole concept is basically, I like to try to explain why I need what I need as far as what I'm asking the CSRs to get me from the customer, why I'm doing it. It's not necessarily, sometimes it's because it runs through my machines at Central Mail easier. Sometimes it's because that's a postal regulation and we have to do it. So. Uh, I just kind of go through all that with them. We, these are all templates supplied by the Postal Service. So we give these to all of our CSRs. They can drop it on the mail piece, see the clear zone. The bottom yellow one is basically where the address information needs to go. You should not have any other address information in that line with the potential of running through those machines and reading the return address again. Uh, aspect ratio one, same thing you saw in all the other ones. So we supply all these, go through the CSRs. Then we've made a few of our own. So software-wise verification, we have requirements that the software is asking us for um, physical addresses, contact name, basic information, and then all the way to what's the customer's nonprofit number, <coughs> excuse me, and mailer ID, which is supplied by the Postal Service, and their permit number. So all of these are required before we can even verify the list. So we print these off, we give them to the CSR, they get the information from the beginning for us and it eliminates all the issues of back and forth. This was one I did to simply inform all the CSRs because we were getting the same questions. They're, they're printing, not mailing when they first started. 
So they were a little confused and we were getting a lot of the same questions. So this is basically as simple as, here's the indice you use when you have this many pieces. If you have a different amount of pieces at, at, at the bottom I've added, you know, here's what you can do with this many, why you use certain indices other, rather than other ones. So this helped tremendously. They can go back. If they've still got questions, like I said, we'll still get calls back and forth. This is a simple clear zone template. I use Photoshop just because I'm more familiar with Photoshop. But uh, any new piece, if the CSRs have a question on, you know, will this work? Are these pictures or is this text going to cause any issues? They'll send them to me. I can review them. And, and like I said, with people being visual, this was some of the easiest way. The CSR can forward this back to the customer. The customer can see how much of their stuff is actually in the way or not, or where I can just shift it over. So we've eliminated a lot of the a lot of the issues with just some simple documents that we transfer back and forth. So this is communication now between the CSR is ready to go to the customer. They've talked to them. They know kind of what they want to do. They're going to the actual customer to start designing the piece and ask all the questions about what requirements they need and what the customer is actually wanting. So again, here's a document that we we generated, kind of a checklist for the CSR as they're talking to the customers. Uh, job number, and PO number, department, all the top information is obviously information I need from printing for billing. The bottom, the little check marks are individual mailing for what the piece is. Is it nonprofit? Is it first class? What's the size of the piece? Uh, is it the correct orientation? Does it fit that aspect ratio? Do they want an indicia? They want it metered. Uh, is the piece coded or not? That's an important one for us because we have multiple inks that we'll have to use to run it through just to address it. Uh, contents of the piece, that's as far as basically, is it just a single letter? Is it three or four pages? Is there a reply envelope? Uh, Address panel orientation, basically that's to make sure it has enough room to fit a barcode in. And, and then this is basically simple. Nobody forgets anything. It's, it's not, we can just kind of cross check each other, fill in the blanks and it makes it simple for everyone and fast. So like I, like I said, this is what I normally tell the CSRs when they, when they go to the customer. The first simple question is, is the piece gonna mail at all? The customer says no it's not going to mail you know we're just putting this on the counter or we're going to pass these out then they don't have to worry about anything they can print whatever they want every no problems everything's solved so if it is that's when all the regulations come into play so this is an easy a good display to call, show you the difference in what what a half an inch can do the bottom envelope the six by nine and a half is is pretty close to the maximum height for a letter. Six and a half goes an eighth, that goes a three eighths of an inch over. Six and an eighth is the maximum height. So three eighths of an inch over the maximum height. So the one envelope is considered a flat, one is considered a letter. Doesn't seem like a big deal, but when you look at nonprofit postage, even as cheap as nonprofit postage is, between the two of those, same exact letter, same contents, that's your difference in postage. So potentially, several hundred dollars to several thousand dollars difference. First class is obviously even bigger than that. So you're going basically from a 55 cent letter to a $1 flat for a half an inch. On the mail piece, basically this is, this seems kind of funny. This is always funny to me, but uh, is there room for an address or is there an address panel at all? And like I said, don't laugh, you'd be shocked. This came from a customer piece was done. This is when we initially started this before printing and mailing started working well together. This is an old piece. So printing printed it, assumed we'll just put a label on it and no big deal. The customer really didn't like the idea of a label and said, can you not just print in white ink? No, well, no, doesn't happen. Sorry. Uh, is there room for the barcode? That basically is going to decide if you're automated or non-automated. Self mailers, like I said, is it? Do they like the tabs? Do they not like the tabs? Is it going to go in an envelope? Is it not? So we get a lot of this around here. The customers have seen something or thought of something, envisioned something. They love it. It's pretty. We try to explain to them it's not always going to work, but it's pretty. This is a perfect example. A lot of these come from you'll notice come from our athletic department. This is. Oh, a couple of year old project. I tried to explain to them 
it looks great on your desk, but if you're really concerned with what it's going to look like in the customer's hand, then you need to see what it's going to do. So I took one, flipped it over face down on my desk, and just gave it a couple of swipes on the desk. This is what the piece looks like. So uh, sometimes you have to be really visual with people so that they get the concept of what you're trying to explain to them. Again, athletics. Red envelopes, that seems to be the fad over the last few years. We have several departments that love the red envelopes being OU Crimson and Cream. So uh, first issue with that is if they're non or if they're first class, postage ink is red. So postage ink does not show up on a red envelope. Obviously with the big foil thing, they can't decide where they want to put the name on the piece. So it just kind of goes wherever on the piece. Again, we still have to put postage on these somewhere. So in order for the red envelope, we're putting postage tapes on each one. So it looks more like that middle one. As you can see on the top, I've written my name on that. You can't see is that also has postage on it. So again, the postage ink is red, you can't see it. The concept is when it goes to the postal service, there equipment is still a little antiquated and older in reads. So the easiest way to do it, if people are trying to do it, is to put the piece on just a regular copy machine and make a copy of it. So that bottom picture is the top envelope with postage and my name on it. That's what the USPS equipment sees. So obviously that piece is not going to be automated through the machine fast at the 36,000 pieces an hour it's gonna to go to somebody to read by hand. So you're delaying the piece, causing them more issues. And, and so uh, we explained to the athletic department, you know, red, tried to steer away from red. Well, they steered away from red, but still didn't solve some of the issues. So it's not necessarily just the red, but that's a key one. So now we're on to print communication. This is basically CSR is done with the customer. It's ready to go to print. So on the print side, they're gonna they're gonna double check and do some quality control on the design. What is everything good? I've tried to educate them as well as far as before we print the piece. If we can eliminate the, the further or the sooner we can eliminate the issue, the better off we're gonna be in the piece. So before it's ever been printed, they should look and see: Does this have an indice on it? Does it have postage on it? Is it gonna have postage on it? They can ask a couple of questions to the CSRs maybe and eliminate some of the issue. Uh, then after the point of printing, it gets onto the folding. Uh, I've explained folding and word tab placement to, to everyone. So they know if it is going to fold and they can look and say, well, it's actually it's going to fold upside down. So we need to do something different. Uh, is the letter designed quick, uh, correctly for a windowed envelope? That's just a quick test run on the letter that's going in a window. Print one, fold it, stick it in there. Is it cutting the barcode off? Is it cutting anything off? Uh, what's going to potentially cause issues later, catch it before it's an issue. The tray and sequence number is strictly for central mail. <coughs> Excuse me. That basically comes to us if there's 500 pieces, if there's 5,000 pieces, separation for the postal service as far as how many go in each tray, that's by zip code and by area. So we, if there's not a number on it, we will add our own sequence number. So at least we can, if something, if you drop a stack in the floor, you can figure out how to put them back in order to match the envelopes. Uh, again, self mailer, is it going in an envelope? The, do I have all the pieces before sending it central mail? We had an issue for, for a while where as they printed pieces, we were getting just random pieces in. So we would have an insert and, and, and not have an idea what it was for. So we've eliminated by simply just holding stuff at printing, the whole job comes to me at one time now. So envelopes, inserts, letters, whatever it may be, I get everything as a whole now. So that saved us a ton because we would get a piece, we would call printing, we try to find out what it was, and everybody's wasting time just trying to figure out what it is. So uh, and then basically finally have they checked each piece quality control or all the pieces good. So now it's to mail. This is communication between mailing services and the USPS. So we, we know the regulations, we've done everything. The mailing comes to me. 
We do quality control checks on the printing. Is the color right? Is there, you know, did something happen? Did somebody not catch it and it made it to us? Binding correct? Are there any damaged or soil pieces? We're going to pull those out before we address them. Uh, any issues that are going to delay or incur extra postage? Hopefully, the CSR can catch that in the design, but obviously, we have multiple checks throughout the whole system to catch any potential issues. Uh, if there are any issues, we can notify the customer or we can discuss first at printing services, do we do we need to fix the issue or are we just gonna, are we gonna reprint it? Um, is it a minor thing and we're talking just a, you know an extra penny in postage? So we, we can decide at that point. Uh, is the mailing prepared correctly for the postal service? Again, that's with the training order. Uh, if it's a flat, is it banded, is it strapped? That's all on our end. Is it ready to go to the postal service and into their system? Paperwork, again, the majority of ours now are strictly online. We're, we're automated. We verify the list when the mailing's done here. We go back into our software, simply push a button. It notifies the postal service that the mailing is coming. And when it gets there, they, they know it's there. They just check it in and it's done. So everything's done. The mailing services, uh, printing jobs are all the way through the system. Everything's complete. So we've delivered it to the Postal Service. Uh, is billing complete? Have we billed uh, printing in, mail prep in, postage in, everything's done. We send all the leftover supplies back to the customer. Obviously, we'll go through them and inspect and make sure that we haven't damaged anything here and they get proper pieces if they want to use the leftovers to pass out or we occasionally have them send them back and say, oh, well, I didn't realize I was going to have a few extras, so let's just do another small mailing. And on to the next job. So any, any issues we may have had through the process, we will uh, go back and contact the CSR and say, hey, next time we do this, if they repeat the same job, can you put a note in there? Let's, let's not do this or let's do this extra and fix, the, fix any problems that we may have had. So that is basically it. And uh, thank you guys. Like I said, this is my first presentation, so I, I hope I didn't fumble it up too bad. So thank you so much for your time. And basically now on to any, any questions anybody may have, I'll see what I can do to uh, help answer. Well, uh, Andy, we do have one. It's from, and I'm, please forgive me if I butcher your name, Donella. Uh, with embellishments such as raised polymer or foil sleeking with textures becoming so popular, do you know of any restrictions for a postcard, or would you recommend those going in an envelope? No, I have not seen any restrictions. Uh, I've noticed several times at the Postal Service, they are they're promoting any, any business they can get. Uh, so they have a ton. There are several classes offered. I didn't mention that in the thing, but there are several classes offered by the Postal Service. Some of them are... Uh, occasionally are free some of them there's you know a minimal charge but they go through mail design potential integration of how you can integrate uh, a mail piece with an electronic email and 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 whatever but they 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 had a whole book that i that i've seen them do with tons of texture and whatever so no i haven't seen any issues with the machines with those uh the foil ones obviously like i showed on the sample the foil ones are a little issue as far as the condition they end up in, but I've never heard the Postal Service, they say they have an issue running them. Okay, uh, and if anybody has a follow-up question or question, you can open your question box. And and from Gordon, and I knew, I knew this was gonna happen. Um, he says, you did great, there's a, but there's a lot of information. He was wondering if there is any way uh, that they could get the templates that you were showing? Sure, the, the easiest way to do that is uh, you can contact your local post office. You should have a, a BSN representative, business service network representative. They will be glad to get those for you. Uh, usually when you ask for them, you'll get two or three of each one. If, if you need several, like if you're gonna give a class, it used to take me a little while because I'd call and I'd request, say I need 50 of this template. That will take a little bit for them to get, but they can do that for you. And those are all free through the Postal Service. Uh, as well, you have the ability to, uh, every area should have a local PCC, uh, Postal Customer Council. So what that is basically is 
it's usually half and half is has half USPS postal representatives and half industry. So it can be anywhere from me from an educational facility to um, uh, insurance agents, paper suppliers, whatever, but everybody communicates back and forth. That's, that's good for networking. That's good for uh, like the templates. You need templates. I've gone through, I've been in the PCC for several years and you get a good network where I can just jump on the phone, call Oklahoma City and bypass the 15 people before them to try to get information. So that's, that's a great thing for somebody to uh, join their local PCC. You get information. They do usually quarterly meetings of any kind of changes that have come up in the postal service or uh, any potential discounts that are coming up. They run little marketing things all the time. So uh, sometimes it's as simple as putting color on a mail piece and they'll give you like a, you know, a 3% discount. Or uh, if you add a barcode, a QR barcode to the piece, direct them to a website or send them somewhere else, they give you a discount. They run several promotional items through the year. So any kind of communication you can get with the Postal Service is going to help. Okay. And uh, from Lisa Basta, she said, I've heard from several people we are not allowed to use red envelopes for mailing. And then she has, can we use red envelopes? I've been told no dark colored envelopes for mailing. I would love that to be the rule, but no, that is not the rule. Uh, we've had red ones, uh, again, with the same department. They did, uh, they, sometimes, like I said, it, it's because it looks pretty. It's here in front of me. It looks great. We had a, the same department do black envelopes, solid black envelopes. So obviously we had to print a meter tape and put on it, and they printed a little tiny, like maybe two inch by four inch address label that went on it to address it. So it's solid black. It's there. They came over. We lined them up, got the labels perfectly flat on there. As they were doing them, she was physically sitting there brushing the envelopes off, cleaning them. And I'm, that's where I'm saying they have no concept of what it goes through once it gets there. Just because you brushed it off here doesn't mean the Postal Service is going to handle it the same way for you. But no, I've not seen any rules as far as the colored envelopes causing issues. Um, the majority of the color that we do, we do first class. So they may they may direct you away from a discounted mailing with the color envelope, but we, we've done several different ones with colored and textured. But like I said, again, being our athletic department, the majority of the time they're in a hurry to get it there. So it goes first class. Okay, and we've got how important, actually, I think we've got two, I'm gonna combine it. Uh, together. Rich Hoffner says, your local PCC is a great resource. Please consider joining. And then uh, how important is it for you to reach out to your PCC? It, it's been great for me because, uh, like I said, mainly for the connections. I, uh, I'm i more of a people person, phone call person than email. Uh, I don't like, if I need something done, I don't want to send 15 emails back and forth. I'd much rather just jump on the phone and call, call someone and say, can you do this for me? So again, with the, some of the strange mail pieces we get, if I've got a CSR that comes to me and asks me a question about a mail piece, and I even have a question on it because it's so strange on how it folds or whatever, I can jump on the phone and I can call Oklahoma City where the piece is going to end up. I'm bypassing even my local post office because I've met someone at the PCC, I can call them directly in Oklahoma City and say, hey, can I mail this piece or what's my problem gonna be? So it eliminates a lot of issues that way. Um, like I said, it eliminates a lot of red tape. I've, I've had issues uh, ordering supplies. I, I had it for the last three days, actually trying to get a pallet of one foot trays, we're out. The local post office is out. So I jump on the phone, I call my BSN in Oklahoma City and said, can you please send me some things? The next morning, there's a whole pile of trays at my local post office waiting for me with my name on it. So yeah, I, I think it's it's priceless for the, the connections that you get. And a lot of the time, it saves you and frustration. And, uh, and on that same um, topic, Lisa uh, Stelter, I'm a board member on our local PCC, and it's fantastic opportunity to learn new things and have the in with the post office. 
Correct. That that is true because I'm I'm on the board as well. Have been for several years. Uh, most normal people don't have a direct line to the postmaster. I mean, once a month when we do our meeting, I'm sitting right next to him. So it's easy to say if I've got an issue. Hey, Mike, can I can you help me out with this? So yeah, a lot of you don't get a lot of face to face time with your local postmaster without jumping through a lot of hoops. So it's great for that. Uh, from Kurt Hastings. Is there info out there for how long a mailing should take to deliver to the customer, depending on which, depending on what way you send it? Let me repeat that. Is there info, info out there for how long a mailing should take to deliver to the customer, depending on what way you send it? Published information, not not really. Uh, again, that's where the contact information comes in handy. I know our local post office, it depends on how busy they are, but Oklahoma City, which is where all of our mail ends up through Norman to Oklahoma City, even a nonprofit mailing, they everybody thinks that, oh, a nonprofit mailing is slow. That's why I don't want to do it. Even though it's saving me a ton of money, I don't want to do it because it's going to take forever to get there. Our local Oklahoma City post office, any nonprofit mailing that goes in, even if they're swamped, say it's Christmas time or you know Black Friday time when they're doing all the flyers and stuff, whatever their busiest time in, that mailing is in and out of the plant in three days. So we, we've done potential tests here to where a department has done one mailing first class and one mailing nonprofit, and the nonprofit one has beat the first class one there. It's gonna depend on the destination uh, and the business of the post office. Well, there's still got some time for more questions if you want to, uh, if you're uh, curious about something, go ahead and send it in. Well, uh, oh gosh, here comes Noah. Oh, Kurt, thank you. <laughs> okay, from Gordon, one more question. Sure. Any regulation on VDP fully versioned and et cetera? Uh, again, uh, not that I've heard. Um, you may want to, if, if you can find your local contact, I have a direct contact at RBS, not RBSN, but the actual business mail entry unit in Oklahoma City. And that's where I send most of my kind of oddball questions on maybe stuff that I don't do all the time or just the random strange mailing, but no, not that I've heard of. Okay. What did I just type in the wrong place? Okay. Um, what was your experience, what has your experience been with informed delivery mailings? This is John Johnson asking. Incoming or uh, incoming now, incoming we do not do, the post office will not allow informed delivery at the university because we mainly we have our unique zip code here for us. So we don't allow it. Um, a lot of our, we have an agreement with the postal service for our student mail that it has to be a fully addressed piece because our students move around so much. So, I think maybe that's some of the reason they don't do it. I would kind of actually prefer them not to do it because some of the stuff that we get, if it's or current resident stuff, a lot of it gets recycled. So that will obviously eliminate the issue of the customer getting a picture of how come this isn't in my mailbox, but we do not do anything of informed delivery coming in. Okay. And and I find this an intriguing question, uh, and I'm really anxious to hear uh, your answer to this. Uh, what is it like working for Sherry? Yeah, I don't know if I can give that answer politically correct. Um, so I, I think I might say no comment on that one. But no, actually, it, it's great. We have a great relationship. Everything works well. Uh, she's learned my personality. John's learned my personality. I think that was an issue when I first took this job. He'd worked with me for years, so he was a little gun shy of giving me the position, but 
I think it's worked out pretty well, but no, we have a great relationship. We can call back and forth, simple, simple, quick question. Uh, I trust her, she trusts me. So it works out great. And there was a, uh, John Johnson had a follow-up question. And John had asked about uh, the your experience with informed delivery mailing. Yes. And, and he follows up with uh, any outgoing informed delivery. I've never had the request for one, actually. I, I have not, I have no experience with that outgoing. So uh, I would probably try again to direct that to uh, the, not a BSN, but the BMEU person, the bulk mail entry unit person, and see what's going on there. But we, we have never done one from here. And I, I don't know if it's because the people aren't informed on it or don't know that it's an option. But uh, we haven't, and we haven't, well, I guess we haven't actually advertised it a lot either, so. Okay, uh, another one from, and I'm, Don, Don, Don it L, if, if I'm pronouncing that wrong, please forgive me. Uh, do you see an increase on augmented reality mailing, mailings? I did a few years ago. Uh, we, we see them occasionally. Uh, I believe printing has done some stuff actually outgoing for departments with some augmented reality stuff on it. Uh, we've used it for our parcel locker video. We have a label on our parcel lockers when the students go to pick one up. If they're new and they don't know how to use it, they can scan a code on it and there's a whole video comes up, shows them how to use the lockers and whatever. But um, I, I have seen a few coming through. Uh, I'm not sure percentage-wise of what that would be, but yes, I I've, I see them come through all the time here. Uh, either that, it, it may be augmented reality as far as videos or just a direct link to, um, I, I know we've done one here where there's been links to directly from the mail piece to our admissions department or to our athletic department, so there have been some like that too. And I was just informed, Danielle, not Danielle, Danielle, Danielle. I could, my, my niece's name is Don, so I kind of knew that was a, uh, the name. Thank you, Don. And she, yes, yeah, she responded, great idea. Okay. All right, we'll keep the question box open for a few more minutes. Um, I did uh, want to, I did omit uh, something about Andy and I apologize. Uh, Andy recently uh, received his IPMA certified mail manager uh, certification. Good job, good job. Uh, if you uh, don't know what, what that is, IPMA has a cert certification program for uh, certified graphic communication managers, which is the CGCM, and then certified mail managers, which is the CMM. And uh, these could you, it really is, it's like a grade card for adults. It's like, yippee, you're on the, you're, you're, you're an A plus student. Uh, and all of our IPMA certified members belong to the IPMA Franklin Stamp and Ink Society. So if anyone is interested in that program, you can find that uh, on our IPMA website, ipma.org. Uh, Carrie says, congrats, Andy. Thank you very much. Okay, well, there's no more questions coming in. Uh, I'll do this. I'm back. Da, 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 da. Andy, I, we just want to thank you so much uh, for everything that you've done and everything that you do for IPMA. Uh, and uh, we are so happy to have you today. So much information, uh, good information. Uh, thank you so much for, for your you time and talent. Thank you very much. Sorry if I stumbled through too much. Thank you guys. No, no, it was great. It was great. Uh, and, and I know you could feel the force right? <laughs> as I was like cheering you on through this. Well, just want to remind everybody that we will reunite in strength in Des Moines, Iowa. Oh, and uh, yes, 
number one uh, number one uh, product agricultural product that uh, before corn was wheat. And I encourage everyone to go to, it's called the World Food Prize Hall of Laureates. It's actually in Des Moines, uh, Iowa, and, uh, to learn about uh, Norman Borlaug. He was actually worked, and his work continues today. He did win the Nobel Peace Prize in 1970 uh, for his, of working on uh, world hunger. And... Uh, just really briefly, what he did was he worked and came up in, uh, with wheat and developed a a drought resistant wheat. And he started working this on this in Mexico. And it's it's he's taken these seeds that he developed all over the world. And and there is in this Hall of Laureates. There is a room, and it has all these pictures of all these people that have been involved in this project, and it's just wonderful. So, I mean, at least take some time to Google it, uh, World Food, Food Prize, Hall of Laureates in Des Moines. Uh, again, just I want to thank Andy. Thank all of you for coming. Uh, reminding you today that today at 2 o'clock Central, uh, Greg Chumley will be with us to present the IPMA uh 2020 white paper, strategic planning for implants. I encourage you, if you have not uh, registered uh, to, for that, to go to ipma.org, and you'll find it right on our uh, the link to get in to register on our front page. Uh, just thank everyone. We will. Uh, I, just, I I sent Andy a request for his PowerPoint. I'm sure he'll send it to me. And as always, the video will be made available on uh, our IPMA member community uh, resources library. One of the things we are doing uh, different with this, this webinar series, we are uh, putting them out on our YouTube channel, in, in plant, and then gotta have a little hyphen, in plant printing and mailing association. Subscribe uh, to the, our YouTube channel and you'll, uh, the videos for, for all of them this week will be posted. Uh, plus a video for uh, our uh, conference. We got some lots of comments coming in from Scott Hocko, Andy. If you're still listening, I hope you are. Uh, uh, he says, "Thank you for your years of expertise, Andy, and sharing your knowledge. You rock." Uh, yes, and I got that. And you spelled Mike Lloyd's name wrong. Uh, so uh, let me. See. I'm just sitting here wondering if I've been talking. Oh, I'm not on mute. It's, I could just. But no, I'm not on mute. So, you guys have a great day. Hope to see you this afternoon. I'm really, really planning on seeing you in Des Moines next year in June. Just love y'all. Yes, thanks for coming.